got a great one today, you know, for a change. Dan Balls, Washington Post chief correspondent, is my guest, one of my go-tos on national politics. I first met Dan in Iowa in 1987. We rode the, the press bus together. Dan is incredibly well respected by the political press corps uh, for his depth of knowledge, his integrity, his insight, and it's just a joy to read and to talk to. And I, I just always learn a lot when I when I read Dan, and I know you'll really enjoy this conversation. You know, for a change, we are are not that far into the presidential cycle, and it's already promising to be one of the weirdest most nerve-wracking, highest-stake elections in our country's history. This this week, House Republicans pass a bill to cut the budget by $4.5 trillion over the next 10 years. Otherwise, they say they will refuse to raise the debt ceiling, which would be disastrous. Of course, I, I was in the Senate in 2011 when they held the debt ceiling hostage and uh, Obama negotiated and we agreed to some pretty draconian cuts in in the middle of the Great Recession. So Biden now says he will not negotiate. He won't negotiate. They have to raise the debt ceiling and then they can negotiate a budget. That's probably not going to happen. McCarthy is such a weak speaker and controlled by some of the most irresponsible members of the Republican caucus. As Dan points out, we've just never been this divided, and we are in a very, very dangerous time. We've never had a candidate for president who stands such a great chance of being indicted multiple times, and yet still appears to be the front runner for the party's nomination. And 70% of Americans say they don't want President Biden to run for re-election, but he is, and he has a strong record to point to. And right now, right now, it's looking like a rematch of 2020. But as Dan points out, a lot can happen to change that. But the stakes are just so high because this country has never been so divided. So why don't we just go right to my conversation with Dan Balls. It is a great one, you know, for a change. Now, you're the chief correspondent. Is that your title? At, uh, at that, that is my title. Correct. Doesn't mean anything. I know. <laughs> but for my money, uh, you're my favorite uh, writer on national politics. Well, I appreciate that. Okay, that might not stay in the podcast. Well, that's fine. <laughs> no, it will. It will. Uh, so <laughs> I'm going to start off with a very specific uh, question. Uh, after the indictment on the Stormy Daniels matter, Trump support went up. I didn't, that didn't surprise me at all. It was, it's sort of the thinnest, if the most sordid, uh, uh, you know, indictment that we're going to have. But then I thought to myself, you know, after when the other ones start coming, <laughs> Georgia uh, and uh, the, the documents, but especially Georgia and, and January 6th, that he's going to start losing the support of, of some of those people, some of those Republicans. And then lately, I've been thinking, no, maybe I'm wrong. What do you think? I think you may be wrong. Um, <laughs> but, but I, but I, I may be right. I know that, you know, you, but I know the, the sort of thought process that you're going through, and I think everybody's going through it. I, I think you have to weigh two different things. One is that the possibility that he could be the Republican nominee and be under multiple indictments would seemingly make him less electable <laughs> in a general election. Yes. <laughs> and when we would begin to see that at some point, you know, next year, that we would begin to see a softening in those numbers. Right. But I think that the counter to that is that people have made assumptions about this, that, and the other thing that, you know, that, that have hit him over the years with the belief that in one way or another, it would cost him support 
particularly within, you know, within the, the base of support that he has. And it generally has not. There was a little bit of a decline after the midterms. He looked more vulnerable at that point. Right. And, but the combination of the indictment and I think just kind of the, the aggressiveness with which he has started the 2024 campaign has brought people back to him. And he has this, this kind of uncanny ability to make people, uh, make Republicans and conservatives come to his defense and support him. And, and it, gives him, it gives him strength in those moments. And we've, we've just seen that again and again and again. So that, I, I think that's the way I, I think about it. I, I do believe that the weight of all this eventually takes a toll. But it, it hasn't happened yet. It, it'll, it'll certainly take a toll with the entire electorate. <laughs> I mean, and right now against Biden, they're pretty even, uh, which is un, uh, pretty unbelievable than nationally. But he, right. in many ways, might be the weakest candidate uh, against the president or not. Well, he might be, but I think that <laughs> supposes that the alternatives to Trump prove themselves to be strong candidates. And that hasn't happened yet at all. That hasn't happened yet. Um, and, and it really can't happen until you get into the primary season and we're not quite there yet. I mean, Governor DeSantis is not an official candidate yet. Nikki Haley is. Asa Hutchinson is, but they've got a long way to go. So there's a, you know, there's a testing period that everybody who wants to be the alternative to Trump is going to have to go through. And, you know, in the early stage, DeSantis has had some clear bumps in the road. Now, what are those bumps? What are those bumps? Are, are they just his tepid uh, delivery or are there some of the choices he's made in, in policy? But to, to me, every time I, I watch him, I go like, oh, boy. You know, no, that's why people like Trump. That's why Republicans <laughs> like Trump, because he uh, has something. He's strong and he has that charisma thing, which that kind of charisma makes me want to vomit. But um, DeSantis, <laughs> I, I, I just watched him today talk about something. I can't remember what it was, of course. Uh, and I'm going like, wow, wow. Uh, Harvard, what, what? Har uh, Harvard, Yale Law, captain of one of the baseball teams, uh, military record, but gee whiz. That's a question. I think it's, I think it's, <laughs> it's two things. I think one is on the policy side, He's having to deal with issues that he never had to deal with in Florida. And, you know, there's a learning curve, even for a governor of a big state. And, sure. you know, we've seen that with, with others. They have to learn the issues and they have to learn the complexity of the issues and they have to learn how to talk about those issues in a way that, you know, that says to people, this guy knows what he's talking about. Like Trump did? <laughs> well, but, Trump, but, but your point on Trump is that Trump was able to focus on issues that had a resonance about him. Actually, he, he understood stuff that no other uh, of the other Republicans didn't understand. For example, uh, I remember him in, in a South Carolina debate and Jeb Bush is there and he is South Carolina, big military state bases and a lot of veterans and, and military there. And he just said the war in Iraq was a big mistake and Bush blew it. Right. You know, not one of the other Republican candidates on the debate would have ever had the nerve to say that or the sakel to say it, as we say in Yiddish the smarts, uh, but he did. So he was speaking to, uh, you know, what Americans felt. He understood that. He, he also identified the, the concerns that people had about globalization, that globalization wasn't a, you know, a win, win, win for every country. And yeah, prior to that, the establishment Republican Party was for all these trade deals. Right. So he, I mean, he had a sense of, the things that he wanted and and certainly he tapped in on immigration now he you know he did it in racist ways but he he tapped into a vein of grievance on that and went farther on it than other candidates 
were prepared to go. He had kind of an agenda that he wanted to run on. And then, as you say, he is a performer and he's got a, you know, he's got a performer's instinct for audience. What has he done to this country? I mean, you keep talking about in your writing uh, the battle over the direction of our country and just how exhausted people are by the turmoil in our country. What has Donald Trump done to this country? I, I, I think a couple of things. One is he has he has deepened the divisions that that existed prior to him coming onto the political scene. I mean, he didn't he didn't create this notion of polarization, but countries become more polarized as a result of his time in office and 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 now. That's one thing. He has threatened the institutions of democracy, whether it is talking about the deep state and trying to go after that, going after the Justice Department, and certainly everything he did after the 2020 election to deny the results as being legitimate and without any widespread fraud that would ever change it. And through all that, he has kind of unleashed forces in the country, you know, that I think are, again, a danger to kind of the health of and, and steadiness and stability uh, of, of our democratic institutions. And I think it's, he's unique in that way in what he's done. And, and he, uh, he seems not to have any real sense of historical perspective on these issues. I mean, I think for Donald Trump, history starts with him. Yeah. You know, another thing that I think he's done is he, he, he's assaulted the notion of there being truth, uh, alternative yeah. facts, fake news. Fake news is something that yeah. I heard him sort of introduce. Uh, that to me is incredibly dangerous because I had never heard a president say stuff like that, which is that we don't know the truth. You know, what you're hearing is fake news and it's impossible to know the truth. And that feels very, very uh, slippery slope to bad stuff, including, you know, uh, fascism and, and that kind of thing. And social media, uh, that with social media and QAnon, I mean, the, number, the percentage of people that believe QAnon stuff is like 15% <laughs> or something yeah. like that, right? Am I, I'm not wrong there. Something like that. Yeah. I don't have the number in my head. It's, it's, it's a larger percentage than you would ever want. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is, uh, I, I, you know, I've looked this up a number of times and I keep, you know, I get 17% sometimes and 15% sometimes. But what they believe is that there, there are elites that uh, kidnap children and take their blood <laughs> and, and drink it. So that, I mean, this, this is 15%. Yeah. That there is a deep state and that it's Hollywood and it's uh, the financial elites. <laughs> they this is so it, you know my listeners look this up go google it and that's these are reputable polling uh, organizations over and over again it's about that that percentage you, it, it, your point about you know the assault on truth is right you know if you if you divide the country up into two large camps what one camp believes is quite contrary to what the other believes and and often is in Contrary to what the truth is, Trump followers believe what Trump tells them. There's kind of no way to bring people back to any kind of agreement because, well, you know, I mean, you, you know this better than I, but the degree to which information sources are now fractured and siloed and whatever term you want to use for it, there's no kind of collective sensibility about who we are as a country at this point. It's, it's, it's just sharply different views. And Trump, I mean, if you look at the speech he gave at Mar-a-Lago the night he was indicted after he flew back from New York, it was full of grievance, not surprising. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, well, you got to give him that <laughs> after being indicted. Yeah, okay, go ahead. It wasn't just about the indictment. 
Uh, no, I know, I know. Right? Uh, and But also just full of falsehoods and lies and what are his most common <laughs> lies that he tells? I, I thought, I, you know, the E. Jean Carroll uh, trial started, I guess, yesterday. And, uh, of course, he's not going to testify because if he did, uh, can you imagine the cross-examination of, um, yeah, uh, un- under your administration, uh, was that when the, the Veterans Choice Act was passed? <laughs> Because you said you said it was 160 times, and it wasn't. This guy, your the Washington Post, I think, chronicled untrue statements that he made uh, during his administration. It was thirty thousand. Yeah, thirty thousand out, outright falsehoods or distortions, or yeah, but yeah. Hence, hard to remember any one of them. You remember when Obama said, if you like your insurance, you can keep it. I think that was, it was called the lie of the year. Can you imagine trying to pick a lie of the year with Trump? (laughs) I mean, (laughs) that would be impossible. It would be, you you could maybe do lie of the day. Anyway, uh, (laughs) let's talk about uh, some of the divisions in the in the country um i mean basically you're right the, the first came down the elevator he said that a lot of the mexicans coming in are, ra- are rapists right i mean he might not even said a lot of them are he might have implied all of them were but finally he had to end up with some of them might be these or i'm sure are good, good people um but uh, okay there's there's race um what what are the divisions in this country, abortion, et cetera. What, what, what do you see? Well, there's race, which is just kind of fundamental to American politics and, and has been forevermore. You know, it's something we, you know, we continue to grapple with. And I think what's happened under Trump is that it, Trump made it okay for, for this to come up from slightly below the surface. It's not that we, we didn't have it racism and discrimination. Oh, do you think there really is uh, uh, discrimination in this country? <laughs> uh, boy, oh boy. Isn't that a, a, a funny argument that we, we have? Yeah. That, I mean, if you, and again, that is one of the divide. You know, um, yeah. my daughter, my daughter was working for the D.C. public school system. They had sort of racial training, sensitivity <laughs> training. And she and she made this point that if you're black and you buy something in a store, you make sure you know where your receipt is when you're leaving the store. Right. And that struck me as, oh, yep, 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 yep. And that's 2023. Well, in fairness, I think she heard that in 2021. <laughs> so things it's have really gotten better. <laughs> anyway, so yeah. we're, so we're clearly divided by race. So that's 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 one. There is now a very large urban rural divide in this country. Is, is part of that economic driven, like demographics uh, that we're sorting? It's partly economic. Yeah, it's partly economic. It's also a, a kind of a you know you. You know, from Minnesota, I mean, people in the rural areas and look at the cities and I mean, there's a there's a kind of a resentment and, and it's it's born in part out of a sense that people who are better off or live in the cities disrespect them, don't don't appreciate their values. There's a there's a very good book that was written by a political science professor, Catherine Kramer at the University of Wisconsin, Madison. I think it came out around the time Trump got elected, and it was really focused on Wisconsin. But she went out and just talked for several years in small coffee classes and things, just talked to people in small towns and rural areas. And and the sense of resentment toward politicians, toward elites was very palpable and a feeling of being left behind. And and in many ways, uh, those parts of the country have been left behind. I mean, the, the, the growth the economic vitality is, you know, tends to, you know, be concentrated now almost totally in the urban areas. But what we've seen is is that Trump has brought out that that rural vote in two ways. One is he he gets bigger percentages than prior Republican candidates have gotten in those areas and 
more people in those areas are voting than were voting before Trump. So my my experience is, uh, you know, when I started campaigning really around the state of Minnesota and just in 2005 campaigning for other Minnesota Democratic candidates. From uh, then until now, this has gotten much, much worse, much worse. And I didn't feel that resentment when I campaigned. I didn't, by and large. And I, you know, would go into, and I would go into like a a guy who made wood burning furnaces and he had Fox on in every room in his factory. But goddamn, he didn't hate me <laughs> you know he, and uh or i don't think so and uh i but i f- feel this is years ago and i just feel like things have changed i i think that's right the other thing that's emerged is the education divide yeah you know in the past people with college degrees and people without college degrees often kind of voted the same percentages but it's you know, the non-college vote now is very, very pro-Trump and, and much more pro-Republican than it used to be. And well-educated people have moved even more toward the Democratic Party, and particularly women, but not just women. I mean, there's there's still a gender gap, a gender division in this country. Trump has obviously done much better with men than with women. But white women with college degrees have moved toward the Democratic Party. But the reality is that the white vote is still a you know, it's still a Republican vote. But, you know, the moving, uh, they didn't just move toward the Democratic Party. They moved to blue areas. And the, and the, the educational divide is partly now that people in red areas, uh, if they get a college degree uh, and a graduate degree, those, those better jobs are in blue areas. And they they sometimes move. That's creating part of the sorting. And I think a big part of the resentment is the just the expense of college and the risk you're taking if you're taking out college loans and not graduating or graduating with this debt. And so there are a lot of people not going to college because of that. It's education is is a huge divider in this country in a lot of different ways. The other thing that's that's worrisome is uh, the degree to which people d- don't see education, and particularly college education, as valuable when we know it still is. It may not be. It may not be for everybody, obviously, but also that it's it's been caught up now in the in the culture wars, um, and that, mm-hmm. that, that that there is a belief that higher education is as much about kind of inculcation of a set of liberal values as it is about learning engineering or, you know, political science or history or chemistry or whatever. That's a change. I mean, I'm I'm so long out of college, but that's a change over the last 25 years that this, this kind of common belief that education is good, you know, and up to a point, the more you have, the, the better you'll do in, in life and career. That's been challenged significantly over the last half dozen years. We, I, I brought up different media and, uh, and you did too, how we used to, you know, listen to Cronkite or Huntley Brinkley. This is when I'm, <laughs> you and I are kids. We're getting <laughs> Well, we are, but, uh, and now it's uh, so divided. Is Fox, uh, I mean, this was a thunderclap that won't change anything. Is that right? Yeah, that could be. I don't know. Um, I don't think it's going to change the way people receive information and therefore the kind of information that people receive. Right. Fox will still be Fox. They've survived. Fox will still be Fox. Losing other. Yeah. You know, and and to be fair, MSNBC will still be MSNBC. But there's a difference. There's a there difference. Is. I mean, I, I I will acknowledge that sometimes when I watch MSNBC, I go like, mm, could you cover something a little different today? I mean, than what was just covered in the previous show. And that is this, you know, today's kind of, you know, liberal talking point. I mean, 
at, at Fox, they are literally given talking points. And one of the other differences is that just what happened with Dominion would not have happened at MSNBC. It just would not right. have. Right. And that's, they I mean, actually, that's the, yeah. they actually adhere to journalistic standards there. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that's a big difference. <laughs> well, as somebody who works in journalism, I think it's an important and good difference. <laughs> I mean, That's sort of your area. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. What we're seeing uh, is, and I think you've said this: red states are getting redder, and blue states are getting bluer. Is that that's fair to say? And how does that speak to the next election? Because remember the uh, the blue wall. And the blue yeah. wall was what was Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, I guess, in Ohio, maybe. No, um, Ohio was never in the blue wall. Ohio was always no, a, no. more, more of a oh, swing state. Oh, you're right. State. You're right. You're yeah. right. Because that was always yeah. a swing state. Whatever yeah. Ohio went, that's so went the nation or whatever. I think my, my th it was my friend Ron Brownstein who coined that phrase, the blue wall. Ron Brownstein is almost as good as you. He, he, I think he's better, he better than I. He's got a bigger brain than I do. Let me just tip my hat to him. He's so smart. Yeah, he's great. He's, he's, he's great. great. So maybe I was yeah. wrong at the beginning here saying you were the best, but yeah. okay. Yeah, he may be. Yeah. But anyway, I think his, I think his original blue wall was like 16 states that had voted for the Democratic nominee for, you know, through, this would have been through 2012, from like 1988 to 2012. In Minnesota, one of them, of course. But now, I mean, your point's right. With, there are just fewer states that are in play in a presidential campaign. 20 years ago or 25 years ago, you would say there were probably 12 or 13 states or 14 states, 15 states that the two campaigns would put money into, would put advertising into. I mean, some tilted a little bit more red than some tilted a little more than blue, but they were, they were reasonably competitive. And there were quite a few states that were very, very competitive. And Ohio was a very competitive state. And Iowa was a very competitive state. Right. And what we've seen now is that 2016 election, the 2020 election and the 2024 election, the real battles in like half a dozen states, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, up north, mm -hmm. Georgia in the south, Arizona and Nevada in the Southwest. You know, Colorado used to be a real swing state. It's moved to the Democrats. Ohio used to be a swing state. It's moved to the Republicans. Florida used to be a swing state. Um, I think it's, you know, given what Trump's been able to do in two elections and what DeSantis and Marco Rubio, frankly, did in 2022, they both won by, you know, 17, 18, 19 points. That's moved. Virginia was, you know, long a Republican state, and then it became a purple state, and now it's trended blue. Glenn Youngkin broke that string, but in a presidential, I think he still put it in a blue category. So it, it, it means that for most of, the, most of the country doesn't really see the campaign. Most of the country doesn't get the advertising that the campaigns are putting up. Most of the country never sees the candidates, except kind of if they're watching kind of national cable and, and they watch it that way. And, and it's possible that Michigan won't really be in play in 2024. I mean, the Democrats had a big year in 2022. Um, so Wisconsin's going to have about $4 billion spent in it. Well, that's that, that Supreme Court uh, race was the most yeah. expensive, of course, ever in history. That was a very significant, and I, I, you've pointed out how the each one of these kinds of this this was be, it was the most expensive because it was so damn important. Yeah. And there are all these incredibly important things happening like every couple of weeks. It seems right. It's 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 like in basketball. It's you know the game of the century every four weeks in playoff time. That brings up another point, Al, of kind of what our politics is today, and that is the, the importance of what's going on in states and state legislatures. The, you know, the Wisconsin race was so important because it, I mean, it will have a profound effect on, on the abortion law there in that state that will get overturned. 
uh, and it, it could force a redrawing of the legislative maps, which, you know, which were heavily gerrymandered by the Republicans in 2010, and, and they still have a big advantage. That could change it. Um, you know, I still think that because of what we were talking about earlier, the kind of sorting that's going on, that, uh, that Republicans will still probably have an easier way of maintaining a decent majority in the Wisconsin legislature. But, but you, 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 you're going to get different maps. But what we've seen in various states, whether it's on abortion or other, what we saw in Tennessee with the expulsion of the, of the, the two young black legislators, um, what we saw yesterday in Montana with the silencing of the trans representative. In terms of getting redder and bluer, we, we've got this situation now where you've just got two significantly different forms of governance, you know, a liberal governance in the, in the deep blue states and a, and a very conservative governance in the red states. And it creates two countries and people, people move on that basis. You know, this gerrymandering is a product partly of the Supreme Court, um, the United States Supreme Court basically saying we are not going to touch this. We're not going to touch partisan gerrymandering, which is they will touch racial gerrymandering, they say. And then in Alabama, they kind of let it slide right in the last election. The, the court is a very divisive um, entity now, institution right now. Um, and this Supreme Court uh, to me, is illegitimate the way they didn't take up Garland and uh, on, on the saying it's an election year. And then they, of course, put in Coney Barrett like eight days before the election. But and, and, and then, of course, Dobbs and abortion, you know, so, but it's more than that. It's going to be it's on and on and on. Right. You can see it in public opinion, Al, the, the, the degree to which the court is seen increasingly as one more partisan institution, you know, and the chief justice has tried, you know, to persuade people that isn't the case, but they've, they've lost credibility. And I don't know how they begin to get that back very easily, given the current makeup of the court. The one institution that was kind of held above others when, you know, when we were heading into this spiral of polarization, it's caught up in it too. But it, it's, you know, it's, it's just reflective of the overall nature of, of political debate and dialogue and, and hostility and, and uh, animosity that, that exists. And I think the Chief Justice is actually m much more culpable uh, for this division than people think. I mean, first of all, if you look at Shelby County, that was his decision. But on Citizens United, the way that was decided, remember he said he was going to call balls and strikes? Right. Um, and that that was a decision that they decided on, not on what they had briefed, uh, not, not on what the original deal was about, which was, can you run a, commer you know, a commercial for a film? Remember that? And I, I think Roberts is much more the villain in this than people give him credit for. So that's just my opinion. But I want to influence you, too. I want you to think about that. I will think about <laughs> Okay. <that>. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. You know, uh, good. I got, got you thinking, uh, which you do all, all, all the time, of course. So... Um, Oh, hey, it's going to get worse and worse, right? Just as the as we get toward the election. Yes, but that's the nature. Well, that's the nature of elections. They get worse and worse the closer you get to election day because <laughs> we're we're in a point in which we either begin to pull back from this or we don't. And so, the twenty twenty four election, I think, will determine whether Donald Trump is ever president again or not. I say I think because. If he loses, maybe he'll run again in 2028. <laughs> but if he loses again, the chances of him, even if he runs again, of even being the nominee are presumably pretty slim. But um, 
I don't think that the defeat of Donald Trump in 2024, if that's the way it turns out, ends what we're in the middle of. Um, right. You know, I, 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 I've said this before, but I was I was on a reporting trip in Europe in 2019 and talking to people particularly about kind of their perceptions of the United States under Donald Trump and, and of Trump. Not surprisingly, it was pretty alarming. Um, you know, they just saw Trump as a force not for good for the, for the alliances and all of that. But one of the things that struck me was that they were looking at 2020 in a way that was slightly different, I think, than I was when I went over there. Um, and that was their view was, well, yeah, 2020 is really important because we can survive four years of Donald Trump, but we may not survive eight years of Donald Trump. But their caveat was, but even if Trump loses the 2020 election, we won't be convinced that America's made a turn back in the other direction until we see what happens in 2024 uh, and whether that's you know, sustained. Uh, and I think you could almost say the same thing now about 2024, that even if Trump were to lose, we're going to have to see where our politics goes after that. And I think that, again, the divisions are so so deep and the reds and blues are so, you know, red and blue that it's not going to, you know, it's it, it will be a continuation in one way, even if Trump is not the central figure. And I think there are a whole bunch of reasons for that. And one is this media schism, uh, the right and left, and, and, and that's also social media. And uh, this, it's scary. It's scary. Um, again, look at the percentages on QAnon. And that's just frightening stuff. And that's not going to change. That's just not going to change. And if anything, may get worse. So, yeah. Oh, well, I, don't, I wanted to end on an optimistic note. So that's up to you now. Right now. <laughs> Boom. Give me a, uh, come on. Come on. <laughs> come on, Dan. That's for politicians like you to talk about. Well, you know, we're a great people. We're a great country. We always have been. Uh, we've had uh, difficult times before. We've always bounced back. And that's, well, uh, that's America, uh, the greatest country on earth and, and I, you know, <laughs> you know I, but i think one can still say that i just think that the timeline on it is different than it used to be this is a longer term conflict that's going on i i, I thought some years ago or five years ago when i would think about this it was that that a lot of this is a result of a country that's that's still in a very you know, a very significant transformation from a majority, you know, not just a majority, overwhelmingly white country and predominantly Christian to a country that is much, much, much more diverse and that is soon going to be, you know, majority minority. Is there another country that has gone through this, uh, this kind of transformation? I don't think so. That's a really good question, and I don't think so. And so, is there any surprise that this has created convulsions and and divisions and anger and and concerns and people who who see those changes as being good and beneficial and and giving voice to people who've not had a voice, as opposed to people who see their you know their the values that they believe in in one way or another being, you know, being brought down and that their place in the world is going to be significantly less. I mean, that's, that's a recipe for, you know, serious conflict. And that's what we are seeing. So the question is, is there a point at which we kind of get through that transition and people come to terms with it? And one, one would say, well, what, where's the younger generation going to take us? Because they, you know, they've grown up in a totally different world than there's your already. optimism. There's your optimistic yeah, statement. And, and it may be that, you know, because of what they have experienced in their young lives, our politics becomes more harmonious again, not without differences where differences are good and debate is good, but done in a way in which 
there can be, you know, something productive about the way we govern ourselves as opposed to constant warfare. I hope that's the case. I mean, I hope that's the case. Well, not only was that a somewhat optimistic, because I'm hoping too, we don't know what the answer to that is, but it was a really smart, insightful uh, re- way to end, I think. So uh, there, you did it. it well, we, you, you landed it. You landed the plane. <laughs> we landed the plane. Right. That's right. With a little bit of prodding from, from the host. That's my job. That's my job. But you landed it. See, good. But I'm, I'm, I'm just talking you down. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm the guy talking you down from the tower. <laughs> <laughs> it was heavy fog. Um, sure one engine one was out. Yeah, sure one way. And my God, you landed the fucking plane. Whew. All right. Thank God. Damn it. That doesn't always happen. We have a lot of crashes here on the Al Franken <laughs> podcast at the end. Well, I'm glad I wasn't part of one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I hope you enjoyed uh, listening. That beautiful music is by Leo Kotke, the great Leo Kotke. I want to thank Peter Ogburn for producing this podcast. We'll talk again next week. 